Lengthy wait times for emergency care have become all too familiar right across the country. Those wait times are now costing lives. Well, when it comes to those important surgeries, we already have a public system opening up the door for privatization, which is going to make healthcare in general in our country even worse. What I've seen has shocked me. People are getting sick because they don't have access to good primary care. But the one common thing about all countries is that there's not one country that copies Canada's healthcare system. Not one. That says it all. Why are healthcare wait times in Canada so incredibly long? Once considered an unassailable centerpiece of this country's identity, an increasing number of Canadians now find themselves worried, anxious, and questioning the very assumptions on which a Canadian healthcare is based. As wait times soar, patients are forced to flee the country, and an aging population threatens to bring the entire system to its knees. But what exactly is driving this crisis and what is the solution? Is it simply a matter of training more doctors and nurses? Do provincial governments merely need to shovel more money to solve the problem? Or are there deep structural deficits embedded within our system's very core that requires us to look beyond our borders for inspiration and serious reform? Do you see some of these wait times stretching into the months? Do you think for a country you know, as wealthy as Canada that should be acceptable? Not at all. And it's actually shameful that it's been allowed to continue. My name is Aaron Gunn and this is Politics Explained. Have you got a family doctor? Me neither. Despite being on a wait list for around three years now, I'm one of the roughly six million Canadians that relies on walk-in clinics, urgent care clinics, and emergency rooms for primary care. Some Canadians are walking out of ERs without even being seen, which can have deadly consequences. There must be a system-wide response to the current crisis, which has been decades in the making. More money is being spent on health care than ever before. It's still not enough. Staff shortages are already shutting emergency rooms in almost every province, all as healthcare workers call for help. You're handcuffed because of system-wide problems. No matter where you stand politically, we can all agree on one thing. There is nothing more important than your health and the health of those around you, something most of us take for granted until, unfortunately, we're forced to appreciate it. But when the inevitable moment comes in your life, when you or someone you love requires serious medical assistance, Canadians have come to rely on our universal health care system, which grants care and treatment to every Canadian, regardless of financial status. And it is this universal system that has been a source of such pride for Canadians over the years. A 2012 Liget poll finding 94% consider our universal healthcare system an important point of national pride. But over the past decade, a growing number of Canadians have become frustrated with how that healthcare is being delivered and the results that are being achieved. In fact, earlier this year, an Ipsos survey showed only 48% were satisfied with the country's healthcare system. One third were no longer confident they'd receive the care they need if they were to fall ill. And an incredible 85% now believe quote unquote drastic changes are needed to save Canadian healthcare altogether. What is going on? I wanted to find out what was causing this growing discontent bordering on alarm that has been spreading across the country. So I left my home on Vancouver Island looking for answers. My first stop was in Maple Ridge, BC, a small city on the outskirts of Vancouver, to meet Brigitte Schneider, a Swiss immigrant to Canada who has grown increasingly frustrated and concerned with the performance and limitations of Canada's universal healthcare system. Early on, we came uh, to BC in 76, and my first daughter was born in 78. And that's where we had very good experiences. She was born prematurely, I, everything was done for us, and we had no complaints for, for a fair number of years and thought this was a good system. And then over time, it started to deteriorate. My husband had a whole bunch of issues, once heart issues, 
where um, his heart specialist asked for certain um, tests to be done and the they said, well, we won't have it done, I don't remember, six, seven months. Mm. And we thought at the time, this should not happen. Nobody should have to run through hoops to get an essential test done. But it wasn't just Brigitte's husband who had to wait for important medical tests. After discovering a stone in her pancreas, Brigitte herself faced the same serious issues of delays. That my GP referred me to a specialist clinic in Vancouver. Mm. It's now two and a half years I haven't heard. Two and a half years? Yes, so what I did last winter when it was two years, I went back to my GP and said, I want another CT scan to check on things. If it's all good, then I won't bother you anymore. Turned out not so good, sent me to a MRI, and this time it was only three months. And <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. And oh. it's not good. I do have uh, chronic pancreatitis now. The stone is blocking the duct and it's uh, enlarging. And and you think that that could have been mitigated or If it had been done at the time, you know, within six months maybe, I would have no problems. The sickest gets care, but that means all the others who will be healed or corrected in no time at all now have to get really sick first mm -hmm. before they get care. And that doesn't, that doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't add up. As frustrating and life-altering as waiting for essential healthcare can be, Perhaps the story of Brigitta is simply an isolated incident. Surely this level of delay is the exception rather than the rule. To find out, I traveled to Montreal to meet with Dr. Roy Epen, one of this country's leading endocrinologists, to see if he's noticed a similar pattern of delays and waiting lists embedded within our entire system. What would you, what would you say the state of, of healthcare in Canada is, at least from your vantage point here in Montreal? One of the big problems with us is wait times. So mm -hmm. wait times are, are ridiculous. There are enormous wait lists for, for all kinds of sort of basic things, cataract surgery, hip surgery, knee surgery. Chronic pain is a debilitating problem. And if you have to wait two, three, four years to get your hip replaced or your knee replaced, um, in, in Quebec, I mean, most specialties, it takes eight months to a year at the minimum to see someone. It can take three or four or five years to get bariatric surgery. These patients, many of them are in a desperate situation. When you, when you really need to have bariatric surgery, it should be done quickly. But unfortunately for many Canadians, many procedures and surgeries in this country are anything but quick. In 2022, according to a report by the Fraser Institute, the average wait time from the point of referral from a GP to the receipt of treatment was more than 27 weeks or over six months, 195% longer than 30 years ago in 1993 when average wait times were just over 9.3 weeks. Stack this onto an average five week wait for a CT scan, five weeks for an ultrasound, and 10 weeks for an MRI, and many Canadians end up waiting for treatment for over a year. Often suffering physical, mental, or quality of life consequences as a result. Consequences, the president of SecondStreet.org, Colin Craig, says fall directly on the shoulders of the government. So it's a huge problem that you have a lot of patients suffering. People that are waiting maybe a year, two years to get their knees, their hips done, they're living with chronic pain. They can't live their lives, they're stuck in their apartments. Uh, you know, we talked to one senior citizen and even just walking across the living room, was a huge ordeal. She had to think ahead of time. Okay, if I'm walking across the living room to go get the TV remote, well, I should do this, that, and the other thing while I'm over there, which is something which able-bodied people obviously don't have to think about, but it's that type of chronic pain that people are living in because the state has mismanaged healthcare. But while wait times for so-called elective procedures like knee replacements and cataracts are well documented in Canada, how about wait times for tests and treatment that could potentially save your life? Are these Canadians also forced to wait and could these wait times actually be costing Canadian lives? I asked that question to Colin, whose nonprofit organization, SecondStreet.org, recently produced a groundbreaking study to examine that very issue. So from everything you've seen and the research you've done and the access to information requests that you've done, 
are there Canadians that would be alive today if it were not for the increasingly long wait times in Canada, including sometimes for very critical operations and procedures? Yes, without a doubt. We kept seeing these stories of patients dying on waiting lists. And the stories would hit the press, not because the government was transparent in disclosing that this awful event occurred, but because either the patients themselves spoke out or their families did, the patients ahead of time, of course. And so we thought it would be interesting to try and see if we could get data on how many patients are dying on waiting lists each year. And since April of 2018, we've re obtained partial data, so not from every health region in Canada, but it shows over 40,000 have died while waiting for a wide array of services. So everything from cataract surgery and knee surgery to procedures which could have potentially saved patients' lives, things like heart operations, cancer treatment, and so forth. One of my colleagues in Nova Scotia was telling me that to see a neurologist can take four years. I mean, if you, most things for a neurology, four years, you may be dead. So in Ontario, there's a young girl named Laura Hillier. Uh, she passed away while waiting for um, uh, a, a bone marrow treatment. She was fighting cancer. She had a donor lined up and everything, but she had to wait too long for bed to free up so that the, the procedure could be done. She passed away. In Alberta, there was a patient, Jerry Dunham, he was waiting for his pacemaker surgery to be put in and uh, the state postponed his procedure because of COVID. Eventually when it was time for you know his procedure to happen, by then he was gone and he left behind a couple of young kids. We talked to a nurse in Ontario. Uh, she's actually, she's a retired nurse, she's lost two daughters because the state took too long to get them the heart procedures that they needed. So these are actual patients that are gone because the government took too long to get them the care that they need. For whatever reason, many provincial governments and health authorities in Canada either don't keep track of how many of their residents died while on healthcare waiting lists, or don't break down what types of surgeries patients who have died were waiting to receive, making it unclear just how many of these Canadians might be alive today had they received a more timely diagnosis or intervention. But what is clear is that this problem is rapidly getting worse. According to data from Second Street, surgical waiting list deaths are up 24% since 2019, a problem that's now being exacerbated by Canada's aging population, something the government should have seen coming from a mile away. No, we only had 40 or 50 years to plan for it, but governments just ignored it. As people get older, well, then that's when they're more likely to develop uh, health problems, pass on, etc. So they have to make sure that they have enough money to cover those costs. So we haven't saved money? Or no, no. no, no. I mean, everyone knew this problem was going to be coming for decades, but no one said, let's put aside some of the money uh, that uh, the boomers are paying right now, back in, you know, when they're in the workforce so that there's, there's funds available to make sure that there's enough money for hip operations and knee operations and so forth. Far from saving money to help manage and care for our aging population, Canadian governments have done the exact opposite, borrowing more than $2.1 trillion to spend on who knows what and leaving the country heavily in debt. Meanwhile, a study commissioned by the Canadian Medical Association predicts the cost of elder care will nearly double by 2031. But as dark as the future looks for Canadian health care in truth, some parts of the country are already beginning to experience a snapshot of what is yet to come, and what's been referred to by many as Canada's looming health care crisis. One of the most publicized cases has been in my own backyard on northern Vancouver Island, where I met with Fran Jenkins in the small community of Port McNeil to hear about her town's struggle to receive timely access to care and how, for some, this healthcare crisis has already begun to hit close to home. How has uh, healthcare access and timely healthcare access changed in the North Island? It's kind of gone from the sublime to the ridiculous. Uh, there was a time where I had a family physician and if I needed to see him, I could call and get an appointment within a week. I mean, how many doctors would there be in Port McNeil? Just... Well, there's four doctors. There's us and we all do call, we all do clinics. Having four doctors still 
barely meets the standard for Port McNeil, mm -hmm. but yet there's an ask for Port McNeil to do all of the primary care, community care, and hospital care for the region. Mm -hmm. It's become exceedingly hard, hard to do. Getting to see a specialist, neurology for example, is terrible. Um, getting a scan or getting to see somebody, the surest way there's a workaround because we're rural people and we're creative, people have to come to the eMERGE because that's the only opportunity we have to send them down and get it done, dealt with now. Because of the lack of doctors in Port McNeil, residents have been forced to use the emergency room as a walk-in clinic, causing chaos in the hospital that Dr. Armagan has seen firsthand. The emergency room is overwhelmed. The emergency room has no place to accommodate people. We have babies being delivered in the uh, in, in sort of corridors in the hospital because the maternity services, the, ma the, the midwives in town don't know where to be able to uh, deliver because they don't have space or facility to do so. But because Port McNeil has become a default for the entire region, uh, you don't get called in, you just stay there. You rarely get to leave. In bigger centers, guys do eight hour, 12 hour shifts and then they go on home. Not in, not in this region, not in Port McNeil. You actually have been at the hospital for more than 24 hours at a... Several times. Really? Yeah. Wow. I think 84 is a re record. And you just catch an hour of sleep You can, you, can. you power nap, you, uh, <laughs> you do what you can, man. Yeah. Yeah. Say you do your 24 hour shift and you, never, you don't get to sleep anyway. The next day, you don't get an off day. It's your clinic day. But overall, the volume has increased as the doctors in the region are leaving, as the doctors are getting burnt out. The joy of, of being a, certainly a family practice physician has been eroded, has been lost. The chaos in emergency rooms and the pain it causes for patients and doctors alike is not just happening in northern Vancouver Island. In fact, with an estimated 6.5 million Canadians living without a family doctor, emergency rooms across the country are being overwhelmed, leading to even longer ER wait times and untold human suffering. Natasha Mills, a mother of three from Victoria, recently had her emotional plea go viral after being forced to leave an emergency room unseen once being told it was a seven hour wait to see a doctor about her large ovarian cyst. Well guys, I'm just leaving Emerge. I can't do it. It's like, since it's a seven and a half hour wait. <sighs> I've got that ovarian cyst that's causing me a lot of issues. I'm just praying it's not gonna burst, because I'll be right back here, but yeah, it's, it's really bad. It's making me feel really uncomfortable. I can't eat, I'm so nauseous. I thought I would just check it out tonight, but nope. So hopefully it'll just somehow resolve on its own. After posting the video, Natasha was flooded with messages from other Victoria residents sharing similar stories. And back in the North Island, the situation is now expected to get even worse. After rolling closures of the emergency rooms in Port Hardy and Alert Bay have now become permanent overnight, forcing all residents facing nighttime emergencies in these communities to seek treatment in Port McNeil's hospital. We started to have rolling ER closures, overnight closures, and it was very challenging for the community to know what was going on, when the ER was going to be opened, and um, if there was going to be a doctor available. So what they did, they made a decision, an operational decision, that the ER would be closed in the evenings from 5 o'clock until, I believe it's 7 o'clock the next morning. Um, it would be closed in the evening and people would be diverted to Port McNeil. Our resources are, are definitely strained. We're starting to see some medicine, m medicine being practiced in the hallways. Now, we have always been the hub of our, you know, the, the, the North Island region, so we service the outlying communities and the, the communities on the islands. Uh, so we're fortunate to have our emergency room open 24 hours a day. Um, but it has overwhelmed it with the activity we see from the, the communities with closed ER being Port Hardy and Alert Bay. While most residents of Port Hardy can likely make the trip, if absolutely required, to receive emergency medical care in Port McNeil, for residents of the island and majority indigenous community of Alert Bay, the consequences of this decision could be the difference between life and death. 
So as far as the Alert Bay thing, uh, you, yeah, there's in the middle of the night, there's nothing. You can, you can, we can call sort of Coast Guard, water taxi, those kind of things to mm -hmm. come for people who presented emergently. But you just hope that there's no emergencies in the middle of the night. But if the weather's bad or if it's too dark, if it's not safe, or if they're too ill, they're never going to survive a boat ride over. So they're stuck with no medical access to medical care when they have a hospital sitting there. I actually spoke to a woman this morning. Uh, first of all, her mother uh, was visiting. So it must have been at the time of day when the ferry was still running. So they called the ambulance. Dorothy's mom didn't make it to the other side on the ferry ride. She died halfway across. And I just think that life could have been saved if that hospital had been opened. I absolutely think we should expect better. Mm. I know the system is overwhelmed. I think it's critical that we get hospitals up and running the way they were. They were running and now all of a sudden they're not. Mm. What's going on? Mm. Why is that? And the rest of the country, unfortunately, isn't doing any better. In fact, just this May, the province of British Columbia made the shocking announcement that due to long delays, some cancer patients would have to be sent for treatment in the United States, while in Vancouver and other Canadian cities, patients facing long wait times have been offered medically assisted dying instead. Now we're also seeing people access or apply for medical aid in dying because they're in so much pain and they can't get the services they need. Whether they're not getting enough through their disability pensions or they're not able to actually find solutions, they're not accessing palliative care, so instead they're choosing to end their lives. So we're in this juxtaposition of not providing access to essential services but providing great access to end of life care and it's kind of embarrassing for Canada on the international stage. How is this happening in a country as wealthy as Canada? Is it simply a function of our aging population and a tightening labor market being felt across the globe? Or are we simply not spending and investing enough money? The Fraser Institute does some very good research managing how long patients have to wait from the time that they visit their family doctor until they actually get the surgery they need. And what their studies have shown is that wait times have basically tripled over the past 30 years. Now, at the same time, government spending on healthcare has exploded. On a per, pay, per person basis, it has increased at nearly double the rate of inflation. So you've got more and more money going into the system each and every year but we're just not seeing the results. According to the Fraser Institute, in 2019, among 28 developed countries with universal health care, Canada was the eighth highest spender on a per person basis and the second highest as a percentage of GDP. Despite this, on almost all key performance metrics, we consistently rank among the worst. This is one of the developed world's most expensive universal access healthcare systems. And at the same time, we have some of the worst access to physicians, to medical technologies, to hospital beds. It's some of the longest waiting lists for access to healthcare in the developed world. We spend more than everybody else does already. The problem is we're getting none of the things in return that you might expect to see in a high spending nation. We spend a lot of money on healthcare, but we have fewer beds per capita. We have fewer doctors per capita. We largely lag a lot of other developed nations when it comes to having these actual frontline resources in the system. And, and, for, and from your perspective or the research you've seen, that's not a, uh, a symptom of just not spending enough money. Like from as far as you can tell Canada, it's, it's not, that's not the issue? No, we, we spend a lot of money as a nation on healthcare. Mm -hmm. So it's not that we don't spend enough money, we're not getting results. We have good people in the system, but we have a very badly designed system, so the results aren't very good. In the early 1970s, Canada had one of the highest physician to population ratios in the developed world, and that's as we began the Medicare experiment. Mm -hmm. As we come now into the 2000s and onwards, we have some, one of the lowest physician to population ratios in the developed world. Uh, we are bottom ranking in terms of physicians per thousand population. We're in the high 20s out of 28 nations. We're 23rd, 24th, 25th on beds per thousand population, hospital beds out of 28 developed nations with universal access healthcare systems. 
Whether it's doctors, acute care beds, or MRI machines per capita, Canada ranked at or near the bottom on almost every single metric among our international peers, while for wait times, we were dead last. But what is it exactly that these other countries are doing? And is there something that we here in Canada could learn? For the first time in Politics Explained History, I traveled outside the country to seek out lessons and best practices from around the world. small European country of around 10 million people is considered to have one of the most innovative healthcare systems in the entire world and like Canada's it's universal and for the most part publicly funded with a couple very important differences. But what are those differences and do they explain the discrepancy with how our respective systems have been able to perform? Once in Stockholm, I met up with Colin Craig, who also happened to be in Sweden producing a documentary of his own. How's the documentary going? It's good. Yeah, good. yeah so far learning lots about the, what's going on here and I think they got a lot to teach us. Okay, lead the way. Sounds good. Together, we met with a series of policy experts, politicians and healthcare professionals to learn more about the Swedish system and their decades long journey of reform beginning with healthcare policy expert and think tank CEO, Gustav Druge. It has been a quite large change for maybe 20, 10, 15 years ago when we opened up the healthcare system for choice. Uh, and it was driving from bad, uh, bad productivity. It was driving from long uh, healthcare queues. It was driving from, a pa uh, a, from the patient's perspective, you are feeling uh, powerless to the big system, always in control. Uh, the changes were, it was a national, on a national level on patient rights that we said, you have actually the right to healthcare within these days. You have 90 days, you have to get treatment in 90 days. And if not, then you're allowed to go to any provider in the whole country. Beginning in the 1990s, Sweden embarked on an aggressive series of reforms to modernize Swedish healthcare, the most significant being the introduction of private competition within their universal, publicly funded system of care. This included the provision that should the public system fail to deliver treatment within 90 days, the government would cover the cost of treatment at a private clinic of the patient's choice. I think the big change is not that we had changed into something but we are allowed for the development so we have opened up for private alternatives the, the big thing is it is public financed i mean if you go to a private doctor the money follows you it, it is not that the municipality or the public sector says either you go with us or not if they uh, mistreat you don't treat you well or you don't get a time like they say we can treat you in six months and then you can say well uh, thank you but i'll try with the next guy within sweden there exist three branches of healthcare funding and delivery the first involves publicly funded publicly managed care much like the hospitals we have here in canada the second involves publicly funded, privately run facilities, up to and including entire hospitals. While the third, much smaller lane, includes privately funded, privately managed healthcare, where Swedes are allowed to pay for expedited treatment if they so choose. We have a very controlled market where we have the, 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 the freedom of the enterprise to come in and help us with innovation and cutting costs, giving more people healthcare in time. We want the public to be funded, uh, the Swedish like we take care of our own yeah. kind of way, but we still want the, the quality that is driving from competition so that we, we, we created the, the choice system. Uh, there's, there's six hospitals in Stockholm. Okay. Five of them are publicly financed and publicly run. Okay. 
and the last one is publicly funded and privately run. Okay. What's, what's kind of the, the origin story which, which led to this hospital being yeah. in existence? Hospital being more than 100 years old, but in the, in the beginning being run by the public. Mm -hmm. uh, then in the 90s there was a lot of privatization discussions and this was one of the hospitals that the government actually decided to try something different with. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's now with a contract with the government, but uh, being run by a private operator. It's almost 30%, three zero difference in price for the government to buy care here, 30% cheaper than to have it in their own facilities. Not only did the introduction of privately delivered, publicly funded care actually save taxpayers money as mandated by law, but it also created critical new capacity to relieve Sweden's strained public health care system significantly lowering wait times, increasing access to care, and improving key healthcare outcomes since the introduction of reforms. And where you have had a policy for a long time opening up for the alternatives, you tend to have much, much shorter queues and waiting lists, surprise, surprise. So you found that where there's more private sector involvement in healthcare, there's shorter queues, there's shorter wait times for everybody? Absolutely. Now we are Top, like top three, top five in the world in, in actual quality. And it's driven from the positive competition. The attitude and the service, the eagerness, because they have to be in place. They have to do it, because otherwise the patient will go somewhere else. The good thing with competition is not that you can choose between what is good and what is bad. The good thing with competition is that you can choose better than good, and better than better. <laughs> because that creates a development, a new entrance. So it's also here, dynamic. We've been successful in, in using the private sector as to increase capacity and actually drive innovation. I think that uh, Canada would have the same opportunities to do that with the help, you know, and, and you can, as a government, it's up to you how much you want to let them in, so to speak. So I would say that it's, it's a fairly risk-free environment and um, looking at examples from instance from Sweden, it's, you know, there's definitely things you can do there that will help drive innovation, efficiency, cost efficiency. But if the introduction of private sector competition has achieved so much success in a country like Sweden, why haven't we adopted similar reforms here in Canada? Is there something inherently different with the country that we call home? Or is it simply another case of politics and interest groups getting in the way. The privatization, the for-profit approach is not going to make things better. In fact, it's going to make things worse. All of this is the very worst version of American-style healthcare, and it must be stopped. For-profit, private care, which is going to make things worse, and it'll make things even harder for people in emergency rooms. Why set up and invest massively in expanding a parallel private system when we already have a public system. The only reason I can think of why this government is so hell-bent on um, wanting the public system to fail is because they're setting up the system for two-tier privatized American-style healthcare. The for-profit privatization, the American-style healthcare system that Doug Ford and Daniel Smith are proposing, the cost is going to go up. We know that's the case. We've seen it again and again with private for-profit delivery. Costs go up. American style healthcare. It's a common refrain for many Canadian politicians, particularly those hostile to serious healthcare reform. But is the rhetoric without justification? Could private sector competition threaten our cherished universal system of care? The U.S. example is the, is the old false dichotomy argument. That is, anything you do to Canadian Medicare necessarily means we will adopt the U.S. healthcare system. This argument can sometimes be as simple and blunt as, in America you need your credit card to swipe in the ambulance before they'll take you to the hospital and accept you and look after you. You must show your insurance card at the door or they'll throw you out on the street. Incredible arguments are made. It is a false argument to say that any reform to the Canadian system requires adopting the non-universal American system. The American system is non-universal by design. As a country that wants a universal access healthcare system, we need to look beyond the United States, beyond our southern neighbor, and look at the other 28 developed nations that have universal access healthcare systems, access to care regardless of ability to pay, and ask the question, what are they doing? And what are they doing? Do these countries also have government-run monopolies like Canada? Or like Sweden, have they embraced competition, choice, and serious reform? 
I posed that question to family physician and author of When Politics Comes Before Patients, Dr. Sean Watley. 28 universal healthcare systems exist around the world. We're the only one that doesn't allow some sort of a hybrid approach. So most of the highest functioning systems around the world allow some blend of services. That happens in the United Kingdom, in Sweden, Switzerland, Japan, Australia, all of them. Every last one has a private parallel healthcare sector, a private option for patients when they wish to not use the public system for whatever reason. With these policies in place, these countries have developed far higher performing universal access healthcare systems than Canada's without spending more on healthcare than we have. Canada has 2.5 hospital beds per 1,000 population. The OECD has on average 4.7. Germany has 8. Japan has something like 11. Ontario, before the, uh, the pandemic, had 1.5, 1.6 acute care beds per 1,000, which is at the level of Mexico. In France, uh, you know, which is not exactly a country known for uh, uh, rampant capitalism, 55% yeah. uh, of hospitals are managed either by not-for-profits or by uh, for-profit corporations. They're not affiliated with government. Uh, and yet, wait times are significantly lower than they are here, and they are all accessible under, our, you know, uh, under the French Universal Health Insurance Scheme. So there's, there's no reason why this sort of model couldn't work in Canada. In fact, in Australia, private insurance uptake is encouraged by the federal government. High income individuals must pay an additional tax if they don't have private health care insurance and the private health care insurance is subsidized because the, the federal government realizes there that when people move into the private sector they remove themselves from the public system. They're no longer a burden on the public purse. That frees up taxpayer funds to look after people who haven't left the system. That frees up resources to look after them as individuals go and look after themselves with their own resources. What I don't understand is why don't we use the best practices from anywhere. Everyone keeps telling me that we don't want to be like the US. I don't want to be like the US either. I want us to be like one of the Scandinavian countries. I want us to be like Sweden or Norway or France or, 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 or the Netherlands, mm -hmm. all of whom have some degree of private care, mm -hmm. um, um, which is sort of a backup to the public system. Throughout the developed world, with the exception of the United States, Every country has universal health care and with the exception of Canada, all of these countries have what's known as mixed systems with both public and private delivery of care. And the results speak for themselves. In France, only 10% of patients were forced to wait more than four months for elective surgery. In Switzerland, it was only 6%. And in Germany, only 1% of patients waited more than four months. In Canada, to put it mildly, wait times can be significantly longer. To see a surgeon for my hip surgery took two years from the time we got the referral just to talk to him. Two years? Two years, and from then on, now till I have my surgery, it's another year and a half. Wow, so three and a half years Three in and total. a half years from the point that I said I need help. And do you have any uh, experience you know anyone back in Switzerland that's gone through something similar that how long they've had to wait? Yes that's a, a close friend who uh, has the same hip problems needs replacement she went to her um, GP who referred her and was told she had to wait three months I'm not quite sure the reason <laughs> she was incensed because that's unusual. So she, so she was frustrated in Switzerland they had to wait three months for yes. a procedure that took you over three years? Uh, right? Three and a half years. What would happen tomorrow? The pr all these private innovations that have been brought in over the past 15-20 uh, years um, that are publicly funded. What would happen tomorrow if they all shut down or the government you know, basically said it's, it's now illegal to basically profit off of health care? It would be a disaster. It would be people would die in health care queues and uh, a lot of people would be unemployed. Several hundred or thousand people would be unemployed. We would have less health care for more money uh, than today. But it isn't strictly the public structure of Canadian healthcare that differentiates it from the rest of the world. It's also how our hospitals and other healthcare institutions receive their funding. A fact explained to me by the former chairman of Vancouver Coastal Health, Kip Woodward. So the hospitals all start with a total annual budget and it's expected that they then fit patient care and all the costs of that patient care into that annual budget. 
and not exceed it. Right now, every Canadian hospital gets a budget, a big bag of money every year, and is told, look after patients. That means every patient through the door is a drain on the hospital's budget. Essentially, every patient that comes in the doors is a cost. So as demands run over, which they always do, uh, you have to begin to ration, which is what we've been doing for really 50 years. One interesting thing that it's come up over and over again is because of these big general budgets that hospitals view patients as a cost as exactly. opposed to like a customer. Exactly. So they're incentivized to basically not treat them in Well, well they're not incentivized to increase the, you know, the amount of surgeries and I mean, it's quite bizarre. Our operating rooms in many of these hospitals are empty half the time. Really? Um, they're, they're not used at night. You know, many of the surgeons will get one day a month to operate. So right. if you had a private system, there would be other places to operate when they're, when they're not getting that opportunity to do it in the public system. Why don't we run our MRIs 24 hours a day? Why don't we run our CT scanners 24 hours a day? Again, that goes to how we fund. Um, you have so much dollars and the radiology department can only spend X amount of dollars. So when we start running tight on budget, we start shutting patients out. We slow down the ORs, we make sure they close at 3 o'clock so that we don't burn our budget in overtime. We have our summer slowdowns and our holiday slowdowns to maintain the budget. Activity-based funding flips this system on its head. The hospital's paid for every patient who arrives at the hospital and is cared for based on the condition they need and their comorbidities or their relative complexity. All of a sudden, the patient now is a, is a resource. They're a source of revenues as opposed to a drain on the budget, and it encourages hospitals to treat more patients efficiently, effectively, and work more patients through the hospital doors. Funding our hospitals and clinics based on how many patients they treat, as well as what type of services they provide, would incentivize these institutions to care for as many patients as possible and, if needed, to increase their capacity. But while this suite of reforms adopted by almost the entire rest of the world has so far been resisted by Canada's political elite, cracks are starting to show. Across this country, we have a healthcare system in crisis. So for me, you know, all options are on the table. The status quo is not working, folks. We need to be creative. Uh, we need to come up with ideas from the sector. I think the answer is there's less and less standing in the way. Uh, more and more people are understanding that we have to we have to do things a little differently. Several premiers, including Ontario Premier Doug Ford, have begun cautiously expanding the role of the private sector within Canada's universal health care system. But no province has been more aggressive in this regard than the province of Quebec. And it's not hard to see why. According to a recent Ipsos survey, 75% of Quebecers support increasing the provision of private care, the highest level in the entire country, leading their provincial government to build two new first-of-their-kind private hospitals and to a surge in independently owned private surgical clinics, one of which we received an exclusive tour of in Quebec City with anesthesiologist and opera MD president Dr. Daniel Lapointe. So yeah. we'll start bantering the uh, uh, sterile part of the, the building where okay. we have all the, uh, the, the operating uh, rooms. Yeah. The block operator. Right the there. block operator, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and and sure this price. is like a, I mean, this is a full, this looks like you're in a hospital. Yeah, you're in a hospital right now. If you, if you don't know, you, you, it looks like you're in a hospital. We're at the same level of equipment. Of course, everything is new. I don't know, there's something, uh, there's some things that we do differently. We would just avoid, you know, uh, putting obstacles in the way of the people working, of the nurses, of uh, the doctors. It always strikes me when I go back to a hospital. I mean, you see all those nurses sitting there mm -hmm. and just writing stuff down on, on patients' files. They're not taking care of patients doing that. They spend something like 40, 50, sometimes 60% of their day writing down stuff. Wow. Just avoid, you know, stopping them from doing their work efficiently, and that goes a long way. The typical surgeon yeah. who performs five knee surgeries in a day yeah. at, the hospital, at the hospital will come here and he will perform something around seven, sometimes eight. Wow. So, uh, so that's, I mean, that's a huge, I mean, you it is a huge difference. through the yeah. system, that's make a big difference. Uh, that it doesn't matter whether or not it is provided in a government-run facility or an entrepreneurial-run facility. What matters is that it's as efficient as possible and actually helps get more people feeling better and get their treatments in time. In jurisdictions that allow privately-run healthcare options like Quebec, 
efficiency and innovation have undoubtedly increased the quality and speed of healthcare delivery. But could the public system become a victim of its success? Could doctors and nurses be lured away by this new competition and public hospitals be left even worse than before? The argument that the private system will simply pull resources from the public system and harm it is, is an argument based on this concept that there's a fixed pie of resources and that pie can only be divided in so many places. When we actually look at the evidence and the reality on the ground, it's actually quite a different picture. We have unemployed Canadian trained specialists unable to find work in Canadian hospitals because of limitations on OR time. There are physician resources idle in Canada today ready to look after patients if only we would let them use some of their spare time in the private sector and private facilities to top up on the OR time that they're not getting in the public system or in the public hospitals. If you had a private public system where you, would, you could mandate people, you have to work a certain number of hours in the public system before you work in the private system. Wouldn't that solve the problem? Mm -hmm. As for the Quebec clinic I toured, it turns out they didn't need to recruit from those already working in the public sector at all. Instead, most of the nurses working there had previously exited public health care altogether. A lot of our staff uh, is made up of retired nurses yeah. who don't want to work full-time in a hospital. Mm -hmm. Th that's how I think we've helped the most here in Quebec. It's that uh, we helped uh, keep active. Sure. Staff, staff that would otherwise have done something else. The conditions of work in the public hospital are not conducive to what they need for their working arrangement, the hours they need to work or the hours they can work or how they wish to structure their working life. The private sector has always been more flexible in this regard and may be able to attract nurses who are currently not available to public hospitals into private facilities. Within the five first, first five years of practice, 30% leave the, the profession. 30%? Yeah, and I think it's a waste of uh, their talent and a waste, mm -hmm. a waste of their interest. I mean, they, they studied for, uh, for mm -hmm. quite a few years and then you just throw that away because uh, you don't fit in that system. Mm -hmm. So, As a record, 94% of nurses report feeling burnt out and trapped within an inflexible bureaucratic public system, an untold number choose to leave their profession every single year, including three I personally know, while others, depending on where they live, may choose to simply leave the country instead. We were able to actually gather data from the Michigan State Licensing Board, which looks at how many Canadian nurses have licenses to work in Michigan. And from there we could survey those nurses and gather information on you know, their, their circumstances. And we were able to calculate there's just under 2,000 nurses in Ontario who regularly commute to Michigan State to work. Nearly 2,000 nurses trained and educated here in Canada have left to work in the U.S. system in Michigan alone, most commonly from the city of Windsor, Ontario. This is the Ambassador Bridge, connecting Detroit, Michigan with Windsor, Ontario over here. It is the busiest international crossing in all of North America and facilitates the trade of tens of billions of dollars of goods every single year. And according to a new bombshell report from secondstreet.org, also facilitates the crossing of hundreds of Canadian nurses every single day. Nurses leaving Ontario, leaving Canada, and coming to work in the United States. So, there's a healthcare crisis in Canada. There's a shortage of a lot of these particular workers. So why are they crossing this international border every single day? Let's go sit down and chat with some of them to find out exactly what their motivations are. A lot of the nurses that I know that uh, are Canadian have worked pretty much their whole career over there. They yeah. love Canadian nurses yeah. because they know they have a very good work ethic. So uh, I went to Detroit and trust me, was welcomed with open arms and now after that, whatever career choices I made were my choices. Are there more nurses that you know in Windsor that, that uh, make the commute and work in the United States and work in Detroit? Oh yeah. Just through word of mouth, I ended up with mostly all Canadian nurses on the unit. Really? Mm -hmm. they, they don't let you get out the door without hiring you on the spot pretty much in Detroit. They, they're, they're so eager for the Canadian nurses. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm working in the U.S. and where else would you work and find mostly all Canadian nurses? I mean, if you're a nurse, the Americans will recruit you. They'll, they'll buy you a house, they'll help pay your mortgage, they'll give you a car, they'll give you a $30,000 bonus. 
Um, nurses are worth their weight in gold, um, and we should know that here too. There's no incentive to be a good nurse in Canada. You know, it's like the union is like, all you have to do is, you know, just show up and whatever, not kill somebody. But that's, that's your basic standard. In the States, they highly prize somebody who is going to work to a higher level. They'll give you opportunities to expand, you know, your scope of practice, you know, uh, they, they reward. Um, just generally speaking, are the working conditions better for nurses in the United States from what you've seen? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, the camaraderie of the, the staff in the States is stronger. I, you know, I, I, to me, the union kind of divides each, each member. It, 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 it brings out a lot of bad um, uh, relationships, I think. There's a lot of nurses right now that are not happy with the status quo and they're not even happy with their unions. They want more work opportunities, maybe a private clinic where they could have regular hours instead of having to work at three in the morning or whatever. But if you're a nurses union and a private clinic comes along or a non-profit clinic and they're getting government contracts, well those clinics might not use unionized staff. Mm -hmm. Whereas right now it's easy for the unions to just say, well don't allow them because then everyone has to depend on the unionized facilities mm -hmm. and the unions themselves soak up the money through union dues and they can control uh, more of the healthcare system. They need to get the union under control. They really do. It's working against them at this point. Um, I, I, I really do feel strongly that they have their own agenda. They like to oppose anything that challenges their monopoly on the healthcare system, which of course isn't good for consumers, in this case patients because monopolies typically aren't very responsive to the needs of the people that they serve. But nursing unions are just part of a Canadian healthcare establishment that have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. There also exists a massive and ever-increasing healthcare bureaucracy, often divided into regional health authorities, that wield immense power both politically and over the healthcare workers themselves. Island Health says a serious patient complaint led to questions about Natteris's competency to practice emergency medicine. Not, as Natteris and some colleagues have argued, as a result of his outspoken criticism of Island Health's top brass in recent days, including calls for its chief medical officer to resign. You've obviously been very critical of, of Island Health. Uh, do you think that's more to do with the current way Island Health is being run or is it the model? There's been a huge growth in healthcare bureaucracy over the past six years of our current provincial government. Um, I've come to appreciate that these large, heavily bureaucratic healthcare authorities don't seem to be very good at delivering frontline care and don't seem very effective or efficient and certainly are not community minded. Why are the, you know, people working in the bureaucracy getting paid so much more at a faster growing rate than the frontline healthcare providers. It just doesn't make sense. We have these people working the front line, mm -hmm. so with the system being functionally overwhelmed, it's more important than ever that resources be well managed. And I think that that's not happening because resources are being managed by people in offices out of community looking at numbers on paper, when in fact the numbers our people. What I see in BC right now is a system that is collapsing mm -hmm. and it's very tough to see because there's real human consequences to this. I was speaking to my friends who were nurses at the hospital and many of them were reluctant to speak because mm -hmm. they feared retribution mm -hmm. from Island Health. Mm -hmm. And a lot of doctors who are Island Health employed will not speak out. They can't afford to risk their job. The health ministries are very political, historically. Doesn't matter what side of the aisle uh, you sit on. Healthcare has always been used as a political wedge issue, and that trickles right down into the management of the systems. But let's look at all the great countries in Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand. They look for the best solutions for the patients. And in all my time, in 30 years plus, I've never really heard a health minister ever lead with the word patient care. And is there a specific characteristic of Canada's healthcare system that isn't in these other systems that's holding ours back? Yes, a complete restriction of access to care through any other means other than the government monopoly. It's the only country in the world that makes it illegal 
for you or your family to go get care when the government doesn't provide it. The BC Health Coalition and Doctors for Medicare rallied at the Camby Surgery Centre on Ash near 12th, operated by Brian Day. Day continues to fight a legal battle while trying to reach a settlement with the province. What the evidence says is that the more for-profit clinics are available in a community, the longer the wait times are for everyone else. So I came to Canada in the 70s, mid, uh, early to mid-70s, and um, everything was really good, like, you know, patients was seen and treated within days or weeks at the most, not months and years as it is now. And, and things started to change in the mid to late 80s. For example, um, you know, we were allocated, myself and my colleagues, uh, in the 70s and late 70s, 22 hours of operating room time a week. By the late 80s, that was cut back to five hours a week. And yet some of us, like, had four or five hundred patients waiting to get into hospital. The government wasn't letting our patients into their hospitals, so why not build our own hospital? And that's exactly what Dr. Day did. In 1996, the Canby Surgery Centre opened, allowing Canadians the option to use their own resources to pay for healthcare services like knee and hip replacements, cataracts, and a reconstructive surgery, as well as screening tests like colonoscopies that can and have saved patients' lives. The clinic has since helped thousands of British Columbians, but in 2009, they found themselves in the center of a massive legal fight, when the BC government, pressured by the BC Nurses Union, sued to shut the clinic down, arguing it was against the law to bill patients for medical services covered by the public healthcare system. And in 2022, the BC Court of Appeal ruled against Dr. Day, despite acknowledging the fact that preventing British Columbians from accessing treatment was a violation of their Section 7 charter rights. No one argues that you shouldn't be able to pay for dentistry or for cosmetic surgery. Um, so if you can pay for treatment that's not really necessary, how can it be unethical to pay for treatment when it is necessary and the government has promised you that care but won't deliver it. There's a well-known story about Angelina Jolie, the actress who had, um, had um, prophylactic breast re removal and implants because she had a special gene that predicts that you're going to get cancer. Angelina Jolie is now waging a real-life war against a disease that threatens to cut short the lives of millions of women. My doctors estimated that I had an 87% risk of breast cancer. Once I knew this was my reality, I decided to be proactive. Five women a year who are on the public wait list for that procedure who are destined to get cancer get the cancer because they don't get treated in time. What the province has done is say, that's too bad, you have no choice but to stay on the wait list and develop cancer. How can that be ethical? If you have a mole on your face that you don't like, you can pay and get that removed immediately. But should you have a mole that you feel might be suspicious, now that's covered by the medical services plan, so now you have to wait to get that mole removed. Think about that for a second. If Canadians require some sort of cosmetic or dental surgery, they are allowed to use their own resources to receive timely access to care, an option that also happens to be available in almost every other country. But if it's your own health on the line, you have no other choice but to wait, with serious and potentially deadly consequences as a result. No one talks about the mental health implications of waiting. No one talks about, you know, the possible addiction to pain control medication. No one talks about the degradation and what it does to a human being. We're not talking about just a shoulder or a knee. We're talking about a whole person and how it can truly derail them. I think it's a shame that, you know, some people have worked hard, hard all their life and the only thing they have left that they can invest on is their own health, their own mm -hmm. body what's left of their lives. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're 80 years old, you may have a few more years where you could walk around, travel a bit, and you will lose those last couple of years that you have just because 
you could afford to have your surgery, but you're not allowed to. I think that's a shame. I think that's, I don't know, that's more of a, you, uh, <laughs> a communist way of thinking. No other developed nation does what Canada does, where we have this prohibition on private options. We force everyone to depend on the state and look at the results. But even in a province like BC, if they wanted to begin experimenting with paid private delivery of care, they do so while running the risk of being punished by the federal government. Which is what happened recently in Alberta and Saskatchewan, who, in a bid to increase capacity at no cost to taxpayers, allowed residents the option to pay for and receive MRIs operated by private companies. In response, the Trudeau government cut transfer payments to these provinces, which were intended for health care. Despite the fact in Canada's constitution that the delivery of health care is a provincial responsibility, and in spite of the bizarre and frankly absurd exception that you can pay to receive health care, just as long as it's outside your own province. I was here operating on three Alberta patients and a colleague in Alberta was simultaneously operating on three British Columbia patients. That's how nonsensical this rule and these laws are. You can't treat British Columbians here who want to pay for treatment, but you can treat an Albertan that can come here that wants to pay for treatment. Yes, yeah, so last week I treated a 28-year-old hockey goalie, not a professional, who flew out from Ontario because he had a, a knee stuck at 45 degrees and was told it was going to be 18 months to get treated in Ontario. Uh, as a Calgarian, if I need knee surgery and I don't want to wait a year in Alberta to get it done, I can fly to Vancouver and pay for private knee surgery there. Someone in Vancouver is not allowed to do that. They are allowed to fly to Calgary and get the surgery done here, but I can't as a Calgarian pay in my own province to get it done. I've had friends go to Calgary, I've had friends go to Toronto for hip surgery. Uh, people have come from Toronto to Canby, people from uh, Alberta come to Canby. Uh, that's what we live in and uh, it seems to be just fine with our political ministers. But what about the moral argument advanced by many that it is fundamentally unethical for one Canadian to receive faster treatment than another? Well, for one thing, there is no evidence to suggest when one citizen pays for treatment, everyone else is left worse off as a result. In fact, data from around the world suggests the exact opposite, that an infusion of private sector capital and innovation increases overall healthcare capacity for societies as a whole. But maybe more importantly is the undeniable reality that some Canadians are already receiving special treatment as it is. Do some people have the ability to, or, to already get around that queue as it already exists? Yes, so there are exempted groups and the, the exempted groups can access healthcare in BC privately. Those exempted groups include um, prisoners, judges, um, federal, other federal employees, um, federally employed um, bureaucrats. So, so just to clarify something, someone's got a serious joint a knee issue, let's say. If they were a middle-class British Columbian who wanted to pay for that, who's, who's got a family and kids, they would not be able to pay for that procedure. That's correct. If they were an inmate committed of some uh, violent crime, incarcerated here in British Columbia, would they be able to get that treatment here? Yes, they would. I liken it to the former Soviet Union in tourist shops where in Moscow if you were a visitor you could buy nice products, you could buy good food, steaks and, and the Muscovites, the, the Moscow residents were not allowed into those stores. We just want the same rights as cats, dogs <laughs> and prisoners. I mean it sounds ludicrous when you say it out loud but quite frankly that's what we were, were fighting for. Sadly for the rest of us, our governments seemingly don't think average Canadians deserve the same treatment or the same opportunities for treatment as our pets, prisoners and especially our politicians, including former NDP leader Jack Layton, who famously received private surgery in Toronto and by his own admission, the BC Supreme Court judge who actually ruled against the Canby Clinic and Dr. Day. So, I mean, there's no way 
a premier would wait on a wait list or a cabinet minister or even uh, you know an MLA or an MP they this is the way it was also done in uh, this is the way it's done in authoritarian countries we have this notion that some people put forward in this country that we all need to suffer on long waiting lists it's a Canadian thing to do or something like that we have to be equal or something like the rite of passage it's yeah, it's not happening right now if, if you're super wealthy, you're not sitting on a government waiting list in Canada, you're flying to the United States, you're going off to Asia, you're going to Europe, wherever. We don't have a two-tier system, we have a 50-tier system. If you know me, I can actually get you pretty much any healthcare you need within a day or two. If you're a board member of the hospital, you think they wait? Mm -hmm. If you're a politician, you think they wait? Uh, you know, I mean, the, the people who wait are the poor and, and the lower middle class. I mean, that's what happened in the middle class. Mm -hmm. There's already different levels of care for different people. Um, there's exceptions for people in politics and higher ups, people who have money. You can't tell me they're waiting six months for an MRI. They are being accommodated and they are getting them earlier because they can pay. And they do. What would you say to people back in Canada, there's a huge debate going on about this, who are you know, scared of any amount of private sector involvement coming into healthcare that's somehow going to ruin I, I, I the I would public. say, sorry, I would say, don't be scared. <laughs> don't be scared that you can make your own choice. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared that you can go somewhere where you can get healthcare instead of queuing. Mm -hmm. Don't be scare, scared of medical and private alternatives offering better services. Don't be scared of not standing in a queue. I mean, do you think it's acceptable in a country that really is as wealthy and developed as Canada that people are having to wait this long for, for health care? No, it's not acceptable at all. This is a rich country. There is a lot of money in the health care systems. I think it's mismanaged. It doesn't go to the places where it has to go. It is a healthcare system that has failed to evolve, that has failed to evolve to new information. We call it part of the Canadian identity. I think one Canadian Premier once said it's always politically expedient to wrap yourself in a flag and proclaim yourself the defender of Medicare. The reality of Medicare though is this is Canada's national embarrassment. This is a very poor healthcare system, especially considering how much we spend on it. Universal care, healthcare isn't universal if you don't actually get the healthcare. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think that that is my, my basic point. And I think that we need to, we really need to look at best practices. Mm -hmm. Where are there places that have similar systems to us who do it better? Mm -hmm. And why do they do it better? And how do they do it better? We should learn from them. But I don't understand the logic that we are only going to provide healthcare in this way that we have done for 50 years. Mm -hmm. In a sector which is the most dynamic and changing day from day with new innovations mm -hmm. all over the world mm -hmm. happening all the time. Mm -hmm. I also don't understand it. It's what we're dealing with in no. Canada. No.